So the beauty way. The beauty way. When I was living in New Mexico, I was in my late teens, and I was uh, studying anthropology. And if you're in New Mexico studying anthropology, there's only one thing to study, right? Southwestern anthropology, where there are so many different cultures and so much known about so much of prehistory and history and, and all of that good stuff. And you know, when you've got the names in the field, you know, W.W. Nibs Hill and Florence Holly Ellis and these people as your teachers, you're going to go there, right? So that's what I became an expert in when I was 17, 18, 19 years old. <laughs> and it was delightful because I arrived at April's home yesterday and she handed me some old Arizona Highways magazines, one of which is the best catalog of southwestern basketry I have ever seen. <laughs> well done you. <laughs> so I got to absorb that last night. And I was really appreciating because you know you may be familiar with some of these wonderful baskets. You know, many of them are huge. And they have these wonderful patterns. Some of them are anthropomorphic. They look like people. Some of them are zoomorphic. They look like animals. And a lot of them are geometric in various ways. And, and you can almost tell which part of the Southwest this basket came from by the pattern on it. Now, that's kind of merged over the years. So it's a little harder now. But it used to be, if I saw a basket, I could tell you, or a pot, I could tell you that was made in such and such a Pueblo, or that was made you know, by the you know, folks down and along the Gila River or whatever. Um, but I, one of the things I became aware of last night as I was looking at these is there's not only the story in the pattern on the basket, but there's also the story in the making of the basket. Uh, a couple of months back, I don't, is Pat or Mary here? Okay, I was staying at Pat and Mary's house and they insisted on lending me this wonderful book. It's called Braiding Sweetgrass. Yes. And it's uh, an ecology professor up in the north, and up in New York. And um, <laughs> she, she knows her. Robin Wall Kimmerer is the author. This is the beginning of the preface. Hold out your hands and let me lay upon them a sheaf a freshly picked sweet grass, loose and flowing like newly washed hair. Golden green and glossy above, the stems are banded with purple and white where they meet the ground. Hold the bundle up to your nose. Find the fragrance of honeyed vanilla over the scent of river water and black earth. In our language, it is called wingashk, the sweet-smelling hair of Mother Earth. Breathe it in, and you start to remember things you didn't know you'd forgotten. So I'm looking at these baskets. You know, we think of baskets. <laughs> But I was looking at these wonderful baskets, and every single group of people uses a different set of materials for their baskets, all right? And so each time there is a basket in front of you, there is a whole story, a story of women going out into the countryside and perhaps digging in the ground with their hands till they find the perfect root, one root from a tree or from a really stable plant. And then they carefully lift that root and they follow it its whole length, all the way, however long it is. And having lifted that root up, they go back and restore the soil. And they clip it off. And then they take it to the stream or the river and they wash it. And usually through a split stick, they will pull the root and get the coating off of it. So you have that white internal part of the root. And then they'll keep it moist while they're working with it because as it dries, it gets very stiff. Okay, so each of these baskets involves that. And these baskets also usually involve something like sweet grass. There's some kind of grassy fiber in them as well. It might be yucca. You know that big spiky yucca plant, right? So you don't cut it all off. You never cut the whole thing. You only take a piece of it and you say, thank you, thank you. 
and you take a piece of it and you take it home and again with split sticks you break up the fiber break up the fiber and then you comb the fiber and then you keep the fiber moist while you're working with it and then as it dries it becomes the stiff base of the, of the basket so each basket has the story of this making of going out and finding the materials and then working with the materials and then keeping the materials together and then there's the making of the basket itself now there was a very famous basket in the southwest. It was made by a woman who lives up in the Utah area. It is um, over 36 inches wide and over 36 inches tall. It is huge. It took her one year and a day to make it. 30 stitches to the inch. Right. That is a lot of weaving. <laughs> And every moment spent putting, you know, just weaving that fiber in and out was spent in either in the meditation or in prayer or in storytelling and conversation with the people around her. So every inch of that basket woven over 366 days. Wow. All the story, all the prayer, all the connectedness is woven into that basket as well. This is the beauty way. It is, the word beauty, as we translate it from the Navajo, is just a terrible translation. You know, very often the English word doesn't even begin to grasp what another language word is, especially in Hebrew. But <laughs> and, and in Navajo, that's the case. And the Navajo people call themselves Diné. They don't call themselves Navajo, right? And Navajo is actually the most recent group of people coming into this country. They are Athabascan speakers. They speak the same thing as the Northwest Coast speakers, modified, and the same as the Woodlands. So the Woodlands came first of the Athabascan language group, and then various of the Northwest Coast folks do. And then the Navajos came in last. They came just a few hundred years before Columbus. So all the land was taken. And the Hopi, the people of peace, that's what Hopi means, people of peace said, you are pastoralists, we are farmers, we will let you use our herding grounds, our hunting grounds for your herds. And so the Hopi accepted the Diné and allowed them to occupy the lands that had been traditionally theirs. And the stories that the Navajos tell of how they came into this country, there was a terrible, terrible destruction of their home of their world, the previous world, and that's how each layer of life is referred to as, as a world. And those of you who are concerned about 2012, it was the ending of a world, not the end of the earth, okay? And the ending of a world is when everything that was familiar is somehow gone. Now that world ended in mud. And if you think about the glaciers melting, and you think about mudslides, <laughs> you know, you can begin to understand it. The current world we're in is to end in fire. And if you think about global warming, you may understand this, okay? So the world that they were coming from had ended in mud. They were, yeah, and they, they had no idea what to do. And always when a world ends, a remnant remains. So there was a remnant of the Diné who had seen their world dissolve into mud. And they didn't know what to do. And out of the mud emerged a pair of twins who are called mud heads. And for years I've had a mud head kachina. It's now with the husband in his house. But it's a, you know, it's a tall, thin being who has knobs of mud and uh, mud all over. And he's mud colored. <laughs> And very powerful beings, if you get into the, the experience of the presence in the community. I had a friend who was hearing odd things in her old <coughs> house one day, and she looked around and there were mudhead footprints in her wall. <laughs> it was very scary for her. But in any case, so the mudhead twins you know, became the guides for the Diné. And they gave them some rules. 
and the rules were very similar to what uh, Tuvia was sharing with us today. Yeah. Don't covet each other's stuff. <laughs> right? Don't go hurting people. <laughs> this doesn't work. Right? And so the twins guided the few remaining Diné through the world's gates. And that those gates basically conform to the different peoples between the Mongolian region, where they came from, down through the Pacific Northwest and the Sierras to the area that we now call Arizona, New Mexico. Now, my last driving trip in New Mexico, I was able to take the road directly north from Gallup. You know, there's Route 66, Interstate 40, right? And it stops at Gallup. And there is a road that goes straight north up into the Four Corners, 666, by the way. And <laughs> it goes right through the Diné Reservation, the, the area that they call home. And I'm going along and I'm feeling that energy. And I look up and there's these two huge rocks, one on either side of the road. And I go, oh my goodness, the twins that guided them home. When they came to that place, they knew they were home. And the Hopi were kind enough to let them stay. Wow. The beauty way is all of that. All right? But it is even more. The beauty way is a way of harmony, a way of balance, a way of fulfillment, a, a path in which everything one touches restores and rejuvenates us and we rejuvenate it. We, it's a restorative path. The word beauty doesn't even begin to touch it. <laughs> All right? So when the Diné were looking at you know, making their new way into the new life, into the new world. They were realizing that we need to be in this full harmonious being. Now there are others, the plains, particularly Lakota, who now call that the red path. The path of the red way, right? But I like the phrase, the beauty way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So there's a number of stories in this wonderful book, the Braiding Sweetgrass book, and one of them is um, about her life growing up in Upper State, New York. And she says she had, she was at one of the various convocations of native tribes in, in, in the U.S. and the North America, and, and there was a man who said, you know, he grew up in the Pacific Northwest, and in the Pacific Northwest, the core of one's being is not the ocean, it's the river. Mm -hmm. It's the life of the river. He says, I was raised by the river. And she thought about that for a little bit, and she said, I was raised by wild strawberries. <laughs> <laughs> Her fondest memories are the smell of the strawberries ripening under the grass in the meadows, in the old pastures. That, you know. And as she was describing that, I was remembering when I was 10 years old, I spent my summers on usually one farm, but one year, for whatever reason, I was on a different farm. It was a dairy farm. And this dairy farm, of course, the first thing you have to do is go out and tell the cows, yes, you can come in now. <laughs> come on, come in. So there I am, you know, it's sunrise. And the dew is on the grass. And tucked underneath the grass are the strawberries, the wild strawberries. So that was my breakfast, <laughs> my first breakfast, <laughs> when I was 10 years old, going out to gather these cows and tell them it was OK to come. So I could relate to what she was saying. You know, she said they would go out every day as, as school let out, and they would check, are they ripe yet? Are they ripe yet? And first there would be the little white bud of the fruit, right? You don't want to touch that. <laughs> and then finally it would begin to show a little red, and they'd know it wasn't ripe, it was going to be sour. But you know, you have to try. <laughs> right? And so you pick a couple of really, really hard sour ones because they're red and they're beautiful. And then finally there is the morning you come out and there's the scent 
the scent that just pervades everything of that warm, luscious sweetness of the berry. We don't allow ourselves much of that in this world, do we? No. Can you imagine taking an afternoon and going into the forest and finding one root and tracing it down to the end? Can you imagine going out into the swamps and finding the, the particular reeds that were perfect for what you need for your next project? There's a group of Maasai women in Africa who have been collecting a particular grass for years and they make beaded work. Historically, that's all they, they used was these reeds and they cut them and dye them. And then, yeah, the Europeans brought them the glass beads, and so the Maasai, that glass bead work, you've seen African bead work, that's the European glass beads. But they used to use this reed. Well, the folks who discovered the most ancient presence of humanity in Old Ivalai Gorge were a family of the Leakey family, L-E-A-K-E-Y, Leakey, Lucky Louis Leakey. And so he, he started this process, and then his son, Robert, and now their children have been working with the Maasai. They've been living there for three generations, this family, right? So they really, really connect with the local people. And what they have found is that they can encourage a marvelous experience of everyone showing up at the one lake where this one kind of reed grows for six weeks a year. 800 Maasai coming in to harvest this and create this beautiful ceremony. Well, what the Leakey family has done is created a line of jewelry to sell to Westerners from these cut and colored beads. And if you were here when we were doing the fair trade, you actually saw some of them. But what they've attempted to do was to say, you have a way that is tied to the earth that can be the way of your sustenance as well as the way of your experience just you know, looking at it. And they have restored a sense of dignity to the Maasai people and in two interesting ways because the women are the ones who make the necklaces, the Leakies supply all the materials for making the necklaces, but the women make them so now they have become very important in the family. And the men are necessary for the harvesting and they want to see the results and so they stopped abusing their women, which is something they had learned from Westerners. They have begun to restore the ancient way of harmonious living. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> What we're calling, what I'm calling the beauty way today was a term that we've taken from the Navajo, the Diné, and the Southwest. But it is the fundamental way of being of all Earth-centered cultures. Feeling that connection, being part of that harmonious, incredibly unfolding, interconnected life. And knowing without a doubt that when we allow it, we are fully supported by our Mother, the Earth. Everything that we wear, everything that we eat, everything we live in was given us by the Mother. The Beauty Way recognizes that. But it's not just an experiential or a verbal recognition. It's a prayerful gratitude, moment by moment these baskets with these materials that have been collected by hand in groups of folks going out into the community and enjoying and, and, and experiencing that process and feeling the silence of the forest and then feeling the life of the earth. You know, there's a, uh, uh, a scent in the of the floor, forest floor that awakens oxytocin in the body. It creates the bonding hormone when you touch that deep humus and smell that earth. And so they get bonded in this process with the planet and they feel that connection. 
And sometimes a woman will organize a trip to go out into the woods to gather materials just because we need this experience. Mm -hmm. The basket will be made someday, but right now we need this experience. Are you familiar with the Japanese healing method called walk in the forest? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it has a Japanese name that I have not learned. But that's what it means, walk in the forest. The fog group is an excellent way to get into that. Get in touch with them. <laughs> Follow the calendar. Walking in the forest as a form of healing, restoring, reconnecting, smelling the richness, allowing that oxytocin to be formed again. Feeling the connection. And knowing in every moment, in every day, everything that we do, everything that we have, comes from the mother. Everything that we are is our spirit being. The spirit of the earth, the spirit of us, becoming humanity. This is the beauty way. Thank you.